You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual So we got to see a politician's dick pic this week. Not the dick pics we were hoping to see. Well, I don't think any of us were really hoping to see Donald Trump's dick pics. We were salivating at the prospect. No, we're not salivating at the prospect of seeing Donald Trump's dick pics. What's the opposite of salivating about something? We were throwing up in our mouths a little bit about the prospect of seeing Donald Trump's dick pics. And there are some political dick pics out this week, but they are not Donald Trump's dick pics. They haven't been released by Stormy Daniels, not yet. They are the dick pics and dirty texts of Cross Coburn, a 19-year-old who was elected to the city council in the small town of Groves, Texas, last November. Groves, Texas, population 15,733, the beating heart of Jefferson County, Texas, which borders on Louisiana, named for Thomas Jefferson, slave-owning author of the Declaration of Independence, surprisingly enough, and not Jefferson Davis, slave-owning president of the Confederacy. Anyway, Coburn, who is gay and single, got on Grindr, the gay hookup app, and chatted with someone who turned around and sent screen grabs of their chats and the photos Coburn shared with him to local media outlets and to other members of the Grove City Council and to the mayor. Whoever sent the photos, presumably the person Coburn was chatting with, included this note. Is this any proper behavior of a councilman to represent himself online or a dating app? I felt the city council should be made aware of the situation. So Coburn was set up. This was a sting, a hit job, a politically motivated grinder chat. It also amounts to an act of revenge porn, which happens to be a crime in Texas. You know, first I got to say, shame on you, KFDM, Fox 4 News, Southwest Texas, for aiding and abetting a revenge pornographer. Fox 4 News showed the photos, not the dick pics themselves, but what are clearly nude photos of Cross Coburn that was sent to the station in an effort to humiliate and drive Cross Coburn from office. They are aiding and abetting, again, this revenge pornographer. And then I got to say, good for you, Cross Coburn for sticking up for yourself in an interview with KFDM Fox 4 News. Good for you for refusing to be sex shamed or gay shamed or nude pic shamed or pickup app shamed. I felt like I was being harassed, discriminated against because I'm a young gay man on city council. That is my personal life and no one should know about it. And you know, I'm sorry if anyone, you know, took it the wrong way, but it really was nothing more complex than It's just my personal life. (laughs) Don't see anything wrong with what I did, and I don't think I should be judged for what happened. Fox 4 News also reached out to the mayor of Groves, Texas, for comment. Here's what Mr. Mayor had to say. It's definitely unconventional behavior. We spoke by phone with Groves Mayor Brad Bailey. He called the photos disturbing. You know, there's uh, nothing illegal or anything that, uh, you know, there is to pursue at this time. If I may quibble, Mr. Mayor, Your Honor, Cross Coburn was engaged in thoroughly conventional behavior. 60 plus percent of young adults have sent and received sex messages and nude photographs. And nearly 30 percent of straight couples now meet online, according to a study conducted by researchers at Stanford University. Meeting online is the second most common way for opposite sex couples to meet, trailing meeting through friends by just a few percentage points. Meeting online long ago overtook meeting in college, at work, through family, or in high school. Looking at the trend lines, meeting online will be the most popular way for straight couples to meet within a few years. It's already the most popular way for same-sex couples to meet. 70% of same-sex couples met online or via hookup apps like Grindr, with meeting on bars coming in a distant second, with just 20% of same-sex couples reporting they first met in a gay bar. And there actually is something illegal here for you to pursue, Mr. Mayor. Put your police department, your best man on it, your best law and order SVU squad, because again, revenge pornography, and Cross Corman is a victim here of revenge pornography. It is a crime in Texas. Not what he did, what was done to him. Ah, As if the mayor's comments were aggravating enough. The reporter went out, did a little vox pop, spoke to some people in the street, man on the street and woman on the street, about their city councilman. 
They're setting examples. That's how I feel. Uh, someone that is in a, a, a sitting uh, position, to me, is someone we need to look up to. Set an example. That is something that a 19-year-old gay elected official is supposed to do because if 19-year-old gay elected officials in small towns in Texas don't set a good example for us all, how will the 71-year-old sexual predator Texas help send to the White House ever learn how to behave himself? All right, before we dive into this week's Savage Lovecast, I will be doing Savage Love live Friday, March 23rd in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Pentagenist Theater, Saturday, March 24th in Madison, Wisconsin at the Barrymore Theater, and Sunday, March 25th at the Royal Oak outside Detroit Theater in Michigan. Go to savagelovecast.com slash events for tickets. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, March 23rd, 24th, 25th, Minneapolis, Madison, and Royal Oak. Join me. We're going to have a good time. All right, coming up on the Magnum subscription edition of the Savage Lovecast that you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com. Twice as long and no ads. Alana Massey joins me to discuss SESTA, a bill working its way through Congress that everybody should know about, that everybody should do something about. That's on the Magnum, on the micro, free edition of the Savage Lovecast. Tons of your cue, lots of my A. All that coming up right now. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter offer code SAVAGE at checkout to get 10% off. That's squarespace.com, offer code SAVAGE. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Bull & Branch, luxury, affordable, fair trade certified sheets. Get 50 bucks off a set of sheets plus free shipping by going to bullandbranch.com and entering Savage. Today's episode is brought to you by Stamps.com. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. And right now you can enjoy the Stamps service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in my code SAVAGE. That's stamps.com, click the mic, enter SAVAGE. Hi, Dan. Uh, I'm a trans guy living in the Pacific Northwest, um, and I'm calling for, I guess, a pep talk. I've heard you talk before about guys losing their hair and about how it's better to shave it off, shave it off and go with it, and I, I'm doing that, but all of the very few representations of bald men that I see in the world are like the rock Vin Diesel, like these very sort of aggro dominant, super masculine dudes. And I'm like a submissive sort of feminine guy. And so I guess I'm just, um, yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about bald guys and how they can be sexy, because that would be really great. Okay. Thanks. You know what's sexy, in addition to baldness on dudes? Confidence in anyone is sexy. And someone who's trying to hide who they are, whatever it is about who they are, from the world, that's not sexy. That tells people I'm not confident in myself. And so, you know, covering up or getting a toupee or combing it the fuck over and pulling it the fuck back and shellacking it into a panel, like, Donald fucking Trump doesn't scream confidence, doesn't scream sexy. Shaving your head and being like, this is me, that screams sexy. You cite some examples of sexy bald guys. I think you mentioned The Rock and I don't remember who else. Picard is sexy. Here's a 50-year-old pop culture reference for the kids out there. Telly Savalas. Look him up. A lot of people thought he was sexy. I didn't think he was sexy. Not because of the baldness, because of everything from the baldness down. But there were people out there back in the day who thought Kojak was a sex symbol. Your question is, where are the submissive, bald, sexy, sex simple guys? Well, get thee to some kink porn go. There are lots of examples out there in kink porn land. I don't know how hardcore your submissiveness is, but in a lot of BDSM circles, shaving the sub's head is one marker of submission. He gives up his hair, and you come with your hair already given the fuck up. So if you want some examples of sexy, subby, bald guys out there, Watch some kink porn. If you want some examples of just sexy, bald guys out there in the world, go outside. Look around. You will see guys who are bald and who are rocking it, not 
combing it over, combing around the back and shellacking it. Hi, Dan. Uh, I'm a 27 year old from Canada and I'm calling with a question about dumping somebody. So I've been dating this man for almost four years and we have a great relationship and I, and I care about him so much, but for several reasons, I don't see him as the person that I ultimately want to marry. And so I feel like I need to end the relationship, but the catch is like, Right now, his father is dying of cancer and has two months to live. So obviously, my boyfriend's like upset and going through a really tough time already at the moment. So I feel like ending a relationship right now would be a really shitty thing to do. So what do I do? Like, obviously, I should wait and support him through this tough time. But like, how long do I wait? I know it's never a convenient time to dump somebody, but I, I feel like a terrible person. So what do I do? Help. No one wants to be dumped. However you dump someone, whenever you dump someone who doesn't want to be dumped, they're going to pick apart that dumping and find fault. They're going to tell you, you dump them in the wrong way at the wrong time. So whatever you do, dump him now, two months before his father dies, that's just cruel and insensitive. Stick with him through this traumatic experience as he leans on you and bonds with you and feels a deeper and stronger emotional connection to you and then wait till after the funeral plus another month or two to dump him, that's not going to be the right way to do it either. You just have to pick your horns here. Are you going to be the terrible person who dumped him while his father was dying? Are you going to be the terrible person who dumped him after his father died? I think when you're looking at the lesser of two evils, you should go with the less evil option. I think the latter is the lesser of those two evils. You like this guy. You love this guy. He is not the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. He is someone you can spend the next four or five months with. During that time, make no promises. Accept no proposals. Give him as much love and support as you can during this tough time. If he brings up the indefinite future, if during this traumatic time in his life, he starts to think about his own mortality, he starts to think about who he wants to spend the rest of his life with, if he starts to think about who he wants with him as a partner when it's his turn to shuffle off his mortal coil, as they say, he may look at you in a different way. He may even, as some people will during a crisis like this, propose to you. And at that moment, you say, Look, we can't talk about the future right now. Let's just be in the present. I don't want you asking me something for the wrong reasons at the wrong time because you're traumatized about this. Let's just wait. Put the future on hold and let's live in the moment. I'm here for you right now. Let's be there together for your dad right now. Just shut that down. And then two, three months later, when you end it, He's going to be angry. He's going to be hurt. There's no way to avoid that anger and hurt. There is no way to frictionlessly stick the dismount when someone does not wish to be dismounted. And you're just going to have to stare it down. And you're just going to have to be the bad guy at that time. You can be the bad guy one way or the other. There's a lesser of two evil choices to make here. And it would be by far the lesser evil for you to wait a few months or five months to end this relationship. Sorry for you. Sorry for your boyfriend. Very sorry for his dad. Hey, y'all. It's Nancy. Have you ever had an idea that you knew needed a website, but you thought, Ugh, I can't build a website? Do I look like some kind of computer wizard to you? Well, Squarespace makes it so easy to crank out a beautiful, professional-looking website or blog or even an online store. They have templates that were created by world-class designers, so you just plop them in there and blam, it looks good. And they have built-in e-commerce so you can sell stuff and make delicious money. There's nothing to patch or upgrade, and if you need help, they have 24-7 support. So you see, you can make it yourself so, so easily and make it stand out with Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code SAVAGE. Hey Dan, I'm a straight married guy in my mid-30s. My wife and I have been married for five years uh, and together in total for 10 years. We had our first child almost five months ago, and then my wife's mom passed away almost two months ago after a battle with cancer. My wife was extremely close with her mom, and during her grieving process, she has understandably experienced waves of depression. 
her sex drive has declined substantially, and she says 90% of the decline is because of her mom's death, not our new lives as parents. She has already worked with a grief counselor and plans on doing more grief counseling soon. We've talked about our current situation in depth, and my wife says that in hopes of jumpstarting her libido, she is game to keep having regular sex, even though her heart isn't really in it right now, and the sex is still a bit physically painful for her after childbirth. While I appreciate this, this offer, it's obviously not an ideal romantic arrangement, and I myself wouldn't enjoy this kind of going through the motions, fake it till you make it type of sex. As an alternative, we could just stop having sex for a while until her libido picks up again, but we have no idea how long that might take. So our question is, which option do you think will get us back to our mutually satisfying sex life more quickly? Wait it out for a while and just enjoy each other's company with no expectation of sex or keep having sex that might not be that enjoyable for either of us in the hopes that her sex drive picks up sooner. I understand what your wife is going through. My mother and I were very close and when my mother passed away, I was a wreck and I was a wreck for weeks and months. I remember what it was like to start trying to have sex again and kind of not be fully present and almost feel like you're betraying the memory of your mother by allowing yourself to experience joy and pleasure again and that kind of joy and pleasure uh, that particular kind when it's so rooted in the other and so tied to the moment and, and you sometimes pop out of sex because sex is so intensely if you're having sex with someone you really care about and you are really in a groove it's so intensely about the moment and there's nothing like the death of a parent or god forbid a child to make you feel like moments are precious and fleeting and we can be taken away from those that we love or those that we love can be taken away from us at any moment and there were times i just willed myself to do it and went through the motions and caught a fucking groove and was glad that i went through the motions and glad to catch that fucking groove and it was a little bit of going through the motions and catching grooves on the regular that helped me get back to initiating sex or responding positively when sex was initiated without falling out of it, without those experiences being tainted by my grief. So that's a vote for the going through the motions. Your wife also has a problem with pain during sex after childbirth. And my hunch is that you and the wife may be defining sex as intercourse. And what you need to do right now while you're going through the motions, and maybe you'll feel a little bit less conflicted about this, is take that physically uncomfortable sex off the fucking menu right now. Go through the motions with some outer course. Go through the motions with some mutual masturbation. Don't have the kind of penetrative sex that your wife, five months after the birth of your child, and congratulations, and isn't life like that, giving you the good shit and the bad shit sometimes, at once, or one great thing and then a terrible thing one right after the fucking other don't have penetrative sex don't have piv have sex be intimate masturbate together use toys do oral you're understandably and to your credit sir hesitant to have sex with your wife right now that she may find emotionally painful or awkward because of her grief but also physically painful because of the lingering after effects of the trauma that is childbirth well, my vote is have some of that awkward, perhaps painful sex tainted by grief. Go through the motions so your wife can catch that groove again like I did after the death of my mother. And don't have that painful sex, vaginal intercourse. Avoid that for the moment. And decoupling those things. You can have the go through the motion, catch a groove sex. You can be intimate. You can have sex that isn't penetrative sex, that isn't PIV sex. And so that you don't have these two negatives perhaps reinforcing each other, not just potentially risky, emotionally painful sex, but then physically painful sex, and that those pains beating off each other or fueling each other. Take the physical pain off the table by taking PIV off the table for months and make it just about reconnecting and being intimate in other ways that are lower stakes for the wife and for you, lower guilt for you. Sometimes I recommend people take penetrative sex off the menu, even if there's nothing else going on, even if there's nothing else wrong, because we can fall into penetrative grooves that are limiting, where we're not being creative or inventive, or really tapping into who our partners are besides 
penetrative objects or penetrating objects. Sometimes just taking penetrative, any sort of penetrative, butt, twat, mouth off the menu and figuring out new ways to reconnect with your partner, particularly in the context of a monogamous relationship, pays dividends. There are real benefits to that. My condolences to your wife on the loss of her mother, to you on the loss of your mother-in-law, and congratulations to you both on the birth of your child. This is Dan Savage, and I say you, you, yes, you need to up your bed game. And conversely, you also need a good night's sleep. That's why I command you to try Bowl and Branch. Everything Bowl and Branch makes, from bedding to blankets, is made from pure 100% organic cotton, which means they start out super soft and get even softer over time. You buy directly from them, so you're essentially paying wholesale prices. Luxury sheets can cost up to $1,000 in the store, but Bowl and Branch sheets are only a couple of hundred bucks. Everyone who tries Bull and Branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews. And Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Fast Company are all talking about Bull and Branch. Bull and Branch also only uses sustainable and responsible methods of sourcing and manufacturing. They donate a portion of every sale to charity to help fight human trafficking while preserving fair prices for consumers. Shipping is free, and you can try them for 30 nights. If you don't love your new sheets, send them back for a refund. But I doubt you'll want to send them back. Either way, there's no risk and no reason not to give these sheets a try. To get you started right now, my listeners get $50 off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com, promo code SAVAGE. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com, promo code SAVAGE, bowlandbranch.com, promo code SAVAGE. Hi, Dan. I'm a 31-year-old cis, white, pansexual female from New York City living abroad in Central America with kind of a weird problem. So I feel like I should preface this by saying that I've been sober and in recovery from drugs and alcohol for just about two and a half years now. And after taking some time off from dating and sex, I only recently started easing back into that pool. Like I said, I'm living abroad to surf and do yoga in between a major career change back home, living my best life here in paradise. And I just started dating and regularly sleeping with a really cute local guy that I like. Long story short, I've been waking him up in the middle of the night and initiating sex with him all while I'm still asleep. Sometimes I remember pieces of it the next day, but for the most part, I only know what he tells me, which is that I physically initiate sex, verbally interact with him, laugh. One time I told him to shut the fuck up, which definitely sounds like me, all normally as though I'm awake, except that I'm asleep and I have little to no recollection of it the next day. Now for a normie, This might be just like a quirky, funny story, but for me, it kicks up a ton of stuff from my past. While still active in my addiction, like many of us addicts and alcoholics, I constantly had sex in blackouts and would come to in the middle of places and beds with people I didn't remember or recognize. And also my last long-term relationship before I got sober was with a guy who would regularly have sex with me, either while I was blacked out or already passed out asleep. I know this guy I'm seeing now is not that guy from the past, and the situation's really not the same, but the same feelings of powerlessness and lack of control and memory are frightening to me. And while I'm not using drugs and alcohol, it also brings back those same feelings of shame and remorse and guilt. I explained all of this to the guy, and he was really open and receptive to everything I said and thanked me for trusting him with all of that. He asked me what he could do and how I would like him to make sure that I'm awake and conscious consciously consenting, not just sleep talking as I've been doing. But I don't know, and surely the onus for this does not rest solely on him, right? I told my sponsor about it back home, and she's having me work through my feelings the 12-step way, you know, like meditate on it, write it out, etc. She suggested in the meantime that I don't have him spend the night, which kind of sucks. So then I called my best friend in Austin and asked her what we always ask each other, which is, what would Dan Savage say? At one point, I tossed out the idea of some kind of light restraint, but I feel like handcuffing myself to the bed in order to keep from sleep fucking him is kind of extreme and probably not the safest option. He doesn't have to fuck you when you initiate sex with him in the middle of the night. There is another option, which is to gently discourage you to hold you and lay with you and put you back to bed, lay you back down, wait it out until you're asleep again. So seems to me that there are options between him having to fuck you when you initiate sex in the middle of the night and him not being allowed to be in your house with you in the middle of the night, lest you initiate sex. And that's just an understanding 
that you seem to have sexomnia. And it's not related to the blackout sex that you were having in the past. Sexomnia is its own independent thing, a form of, quoting now, non-rapid eye movement, N-R-E-M, parasomnia, similar to sleepwalking, that causes people to engage in sexual acts such as masturbation, fondling intercourse, sometimes rape, when they're asleep. That's your problem now. It has nothing to do with your drinking. You need to, I'm not your sponsor, and I'm not a 12-stepper, but it seems to me you need to take a hatchet to the association you're making to the drunken blackout sex you had when you were abusing drugs and alcohol, and the middle of the night not fully conscious or unconscious sex you're initiating with a trusted partner in a completely sober but unconscious state. Two different things. Two very different things. You can handcuff yourself to the bed. It is possible to have sexual intercourse with someone who is handcuffed to something and is initiating sex with you. So that's not the solution that you seem to think it is. But it could be fun. But I would try that in the middle of the day if I were you. So the rule for your boyfriend, this lovely local guy, that you're banging when he spends the night is no middle of the night sex. We have sex during the day when we're both wide awake, when we initiate in a fully conscious state, any sex that I attempt to initiate with you after we've gone to sleep in a dark room in the middle of the night. Yeah, I'm not awake. Don't take me up on it. I'm not going to feel good about it in the morning. In fact, if you take me up on that kind of offer again, I'm not saying you did anything wrong when you took me up on those kinds of offers in the past because we didn't understand exactly what was going on, but you don't have my consent to fuck me when I initiate sex with you in the middle of the night when I am going to be, past as prologue, asleep. So we have sex in the middle of the day when we're both wide the fuck awake, maybe right after surfing. The U.S. Postal Service is an important tool for any business reaching every household every day. And Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll even send you a digital scale, which will automatically calculate the exact postage, and they'll help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. No need to lease expensive postage meters and no long-term commitments. And right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in SAVAGE. That's Stamps.com. Enter SAVAGE, S-A-V-A-G-E, for a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. Hey, Dan. I'm a straight polyamorous guy from Croatia. I often heard you talk about DADT, or don't ask, don't tell. I believe you described it as an arrangement for partners who can't be monogamous, but also don't like to hear about their partner having sex with others. Do what you need to do, just don't tell me about it, right? I tried this and it failed miserably. I'm trying not to project my own situations, but I was wondering how this could ever work, especially with partners who are living together. Hiding the fact that you have other partners sounds impossible to me. Every time you look at your phone and smile, every time you talk about your day and have a weird inconsistency, your partner will just know. Either your partner is okay with it or they aren't. I can't see why consensually hiding this could ever be a good idea. But I remember you said that it worked for many people. Can you and some of your listeners shed some light on the logistics of this arrangement. A DADT, that's a don't ask, don't tell arrangement, does two things. It allows two people who maybe made a monogamous commitment, maybe would prefer to have a monogamous commitment, but monogamy isn't working for them, and one or both partners are willing to tolerate a little outside sexual contact if it means saving the relationship, if it's the only way to save the relationship. But one or perhaps both partners don't want to be tormented by the mental images of their partner fucking somebody else. They just don't want to know. And so you don't tell them. The other thing that DADT accomplishes, it really puts a lid on it. It really limits the opportunity to have sex with others or many others because you're only going to be able to have sex with someone else at a time or in a place or with a person where it's not going to get back to your primary partner, where the telling isn't going to be done by you or 
an incriminating text message or a creepy smile on your face when you're getting sexts from this other person you're fucking. DADT doesn't really work with the having of other partners, ongoing sexual romantic connections with others. That doesn't work well with DADT because it's hard to avoid the tell in a situation like that. It's hard to avoid the tell if you've got another girlfriend or three in your community. That's going to get back to your partner. Part of DADT is not just I don't tell you, but circumstance doesn't tell you either. Friends, coworkers, emails, Instagram posts, they don't tell you either. Nobody tells you. I have sex with others, maybe. You have sex with others, maybe. But never with someone where it's going to get back to you in any way. And some people are comfortable with that, not just because they don't want to be tormented by the mental images, but because it really limits the opportunities to have sex with others. It's going to keep it, the outside sexual contact, to a low roar, to a minimum. If what you want is the ability to have concurrent sexual and romantic relationships, secondary partners, then yeah, DADT is not going to work for you. DADT is like a rarely used, once in a while, all the planets aligned hall pass. It is not polyamory. DADT works well for people who are invested in appearing to be socially monogamous, even if they know that their relationship isn't sexually monogamous. You described yourself at the top of the call as polyamorous. I don't know very many people who consider themselves poly who smile on or adopt the DADT model. It's better for people who wish they were capable of monogamy but can't do it, not for people who identify or would like to identify or like to be polyamorous. Hi, Dan. I'm a um, 30-year-old woman living in Seattle, and I've been dating this woman now for about four months. And so I, last night we were going out to celebrate my birthday, and she was supposed to meet me there from her house, and my dog was at her house because we were going to be going there afterwards. And so she ended up not going out because she wanted to stay home with my dog. And this has actually been worrying me now for a while because I'm concerned that she likes my dog more than me and our relationship. We're very healthy, sexual relationship, great radical transparency, very respectful. But in the end, I'm not sure what what's more important to her, the companionship she has with my dog or with me. Your girlfriend stood you up on your birthday so she could spend a quiet night at home with your dog. Yeah, why? I realized it was just last night when you called, but why is she still your girlfriend exactly? Somebody four months in who stands you up on your birthday so that they can spend a quiet night at home reading or watching Berlin Babylon or with your dog or whatever else, that person is in a radical way being transparent about how little they care about you. They're radically transparently not that into you to borrow the overused nineties phrase. Yeah, this is over and you need to end it. She kind of ended it. She kind of said, please break up with me when she blew off your birthday to spend the night at home alone with your dog. Sounds like the kind of person who makes themselves intolerable until you dump them. And this was perhaps the first salvo. I don't know. I wasn't present for the first four months. You haven't ticked off everything that's gone on in your relationship. Maybe she's fired other shots across the bow, but she's letting you know that you're going to need to dump her. And the assholery will increase over time until you do that thing and you dump her. Just make sure your dog is at your apartment the night you dump her. Unless, and I hate to introduce ambiguity when I'm ordering someone to break up with somebody, unless there's some extenuating circumstance here. Was it a quiet candlelight dinner for two and your girlfriend stood you up and you sat there alone in a restaurant and had dinner all by yourself on your birthday? Or were you having some kind of rager party in a bar and there were going to be 40 of your closest friends there and your girlfriend was probably going to get 11 seconds of FaceTime with you and she texted you or called you and said, you know what, let's you and I hang out at home when you get back. I have a cake here for you and some champagne so we can have some private time together because I'm not an extrovert and a bar environment isn't my environment. Unless there's some 
extenuating circumstance like that, which if it was like that, you should have included those details in your call. And the fact that you omitted them from your call means you were working the ref. You're going to have to dump her. Hey, Dan. I am a lesbian on the West Coast, um, mid-30s, and I'm calling for sex advice, not necessarily for myself, but actually for my pet. So I'm a dog owner. Um, my dog is eight years old. He has a lot of energy. He's still very much a puppy at heart. And when I take him to dog parks, um, sometimes he likes to engage in a little humping action. And um, sometimes it's just, you know, a, a little bit of mounting, but sometimes it gets pretty raunchy. Um, my question is about other dog parents and their reactions to this. So sometimes, I mean, people have been so offended by my dog humping their dog that they have lashed out at me or told me I need to leave. Um, I don't know what to, I try to stop the behavior. I try to yell his name and, you know, ask him to come. Or sometimes if he's close to me, I will pull him off the other dog. Um, I just don't know how to teach him to stop. Um, and it's not something I can really train out of him unless I socialize him. And I, I really don't want to just keep him at home and keep him away from other dogs because he really enjoys being social. He's very friendly. He needs the exercise. Um, so yeah, what do I do? Are these other dog parents being sex negative and I should just kind of laugh it off? I try to tell them like, oh, you know, sometimes he humps, um, but you know, usually other dogs will correct him. Um, most of the time they're like, yeah, yeah, just being dogs. But then as soon as it starts happening, I have like a total freak out and everybody else has a freak out. And I feel like my dog is some kind of sexual predator. Please help. Sounds like Harvey Weinstein's career was reincarnated as your dog. Dogs hump. I, I'm not a dog fan. I am a dog owner. We have, I have, I live with, I tolerate, I put up with two dogs. One a tiny 16-year-old blind deaf toy poodle and one a horse-sized standard poodle. And yeah, I've seen them hump things. They hump things. That's what dogs do. I thought dog owners were generally kind of tolerant about the humpery that dogs engage in, particularly in dog parks where dogs get to run around off leash and interact in doggy dog ways with each other. If I were you, I would continue to go to the dog park. And when people freak out because your dog humped their dog, I would just laugh it the fuck off. I would intervene, pull my dog off their dog as you're doing, Perhaps take my dog to a trainer if that's something that can be trained out of a dog. But I wouldn't worry about it too much. You also have the option, and it's been effective at our house, to keep the dog from tackling people as they come in the front door, of getting a shock collar. I believe they're controversial among people who like dogs, but I don't. So not controversial at my house for dogs or anybody else. Uh, hi, Dan. So I'm calling because I have a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a funny problem. So I've been dating this girl for about uh, eight months now, and it's great. Uh, I really, really like her. So, you know, we're, we're doing well. And whenever we spend the night together, we tend to uh, we, we, we do it at her place just because I have a roommate and she doesn't. And that's just how it works out. And that's also pretty good. But she does have this dog, this little cute poodle. I think it's a, a toy poodle who I love. He's he's pretty cool, and yeah, and that, that's so that all sounds fine. But in the past two weeks, my girlfriend she threw me this idea of maybe letting the dog in while we have sex before she would just close the door on him and he'd whine for like a minute before uh, finding some place else to nap, which is all right. But she threw me this idea, as I said, um, of having him in the room. And I said, sure, in theory, you know, that's, it's nothing to me. That's fine. And I'm sure she's getting some, uh, you know, sweet exhibitionist thrills out of it. Yeah. The thing is, the dog does put me off a little. I think it's a little weird. He just normally just lies down on the bed uh, and just chills. Um, every now and again, you know, he would paw one of us for some pets, or for, for some pets, which is also pretty cute, but also not very helpful. And I'm just, like, I guess my question is, like, what are the sort of moral and ethical implications of this? Like, the dog doesn't know what's going on, uh, probably. Um, but it seems a little messed up to be basically using him like this. 
And I've not brought this up with my girlfriend yet because my injections, as you can maybe tell, are kind of half-formed at the moment. But I'm just wondering, like, uh, if you could maybe lend me your insight about, you know, uh, involving, involving your pets with your sex life, which kind of sounds weird when you put it that way. If your girlfriend is getting some sort of sweet exhibitionist thrill out of having sex in front of her dog, seems to me that you want to put her out of the room. Or you want to put yourself out of the room. You're imparting to your girlfriend a motive here that just is kind of blowing my mind. You're assuming because she wants to let the dog in the room that she gets off on the dog being in the room. And that's a major leap. Unless there's some evidence that the sex is more pleasurable for your girlfriend or she is incorporating the dog somehow into the sex that you're having in a real way. Even if it's not a physical way, but there's some eye contact connection that's making her orgasms more intense because her beloved toy poodle is present. I wouldn't impute that motive to your girlfriend. That's fucking crazy. You need to have a little conversation with your girlfriend. I think your girlfriend just can't stand to let the dog whine outside the door, that she feels bad for the dog, not that she feels good or better or the sex is better with the dog in the room, but that she just doesn't have it in her heart to let her poor little toy poodle whine for a minute and then stalk off somewhere else in the apartment and feel sad as the dog finds somewhere else to rest. People who really like dogs, and I'm married to one of those people, sometimes they're crazy. Sometimes they really worry about their dogs having a big sad that the dog probably isn't having. The dog's just found somewhere else in the apartment or the house to go lick their butt. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with letting the dog sit on the bed. Our dogs have seen things that would kill some people. Rick Santorum, Mike Pence, Mike Pence's wife, mother. Our dogs have seen things that would stop all three of their hearts. Perhaps we should send them a video. And it's not going to harm the dog. And unless your girlfriend is somehow physically communicating to you that the sex is better with the dog there, I can't imagine that she is getting any sort of exhibitionist thrill. She is just more at peace because she ha doesn't have to split her focus between the sex she's having with you and her concern for her beloved toy poodle who she thinks is having a sad somewhere else in the apartment after he stops whining and walks away. Really, either solution is a workable one. Let the dog wander off after whining for a minute if unless it breaks your girlfriend's heart or let the dog in the room and the dog is not going to be harmed. Dogs have been watching humans fuck for 30,000 years for as long as there have been dogs. Dogs have been watching humans fuck to no ill effect. Thus concludes the dog whisperer section of today's show. No more dog questions, Nancy. I'm done. I'm calling in response to the getting the cum on the sheath, Dan, you missed the mark so much on that one. It is so much more like a woman squirting. And if my girlfriend was squirting, she better damn well put a towel down on the bed before she does, because that is a mess. There's also the consideration that women end up taking up more of the housework than men. So maybe he's not being careful, and maybe he never takes the incentive to wash the sheets after they get dirty. If she's washing them all the time, yeah, I'd get a little pissy too. Hi, Dan. This is a sex educator from Chicago, and I just have a quick correction. On your last episode, you said that fleshlights are made out of silicone. Silicone is a non-porous, hypoallergenic material that's super safe, and I want to be very clear that fleshlights are not made out of silicone. They're made out of cyber skin, which is porous and can trap bacteria. So that means if any listeners out there are using a fleshlight and you want to share it with a sex partner, you need to make sure that sex partner is wearing a condom to keep it safe. Also, if you're using a fleshlight on your own, it's a really good idea to keep it super clean. Uh, you just want to clean it with soap and water, let it air dry, and once it's dry, powder it with cornstarch to keep the texture intact. Hey, Dan. Response to the 46-year-old woman in episode 594 who's having magnificent orgasms. One thing that you didn't mention is that, at least I've had this experience, at 46, my body is so much different and sex is so much better than it ever was. And I don't know, that's just, I think, an age thing. I chalk it up to I'm far more in touch with my own physical sensations of desire. And when I do get into penetrative sex, it's fucking amazing. And it never was. It's not the difference of the person or even the device, because 
<laughs> that's been the same for 11 years, but the sex is better. So maybe it's just something about women when they're aging makes it better. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. You can also record your question on your own computer or phone and email it to us at voicemail at savagelovecast.com. We have some beautiful new Savage Lovecast t-shirts available at savagelovecast.com slash shop and if you aren't already you should be a member of our facebook group go to facebook and search for savage love follow me on twitter at fake dan savage follow alana massey on twitter at alana massey the savage love cast is produced every week by nancy hartunian and me and nancy and the tech savvy at risk youth we'll all be back at you next week with an installment of the savage love cast thanks for downloading.